All right. So here's Rhino. Here's Grasshopper. Um, I mean, if if you you can actually uh, run Rhino script, you can run Python um, and begin to extend things yourself, sort of drive things under the hood, so to say. Um, but uh, for for others, um, not sure why. It's kind of laggy. Hmm. It's probably from the recording. But anyway, um, so uh, Grasshopper, right? Um, so. This brings up an interface as a separate window. It rides above Rhino. Sometimes it gets stuck and then it gets slipped behind Rhino and you can always minimize Rhino, um, maximize it again and, and Grasshopper will pop back up. Um, but it's something that runs in parallel with Rhino. Um, and I'm just gonna go ahead and, and uh, open up one of these files. I'll call this one SunPath. All right, this is the SunPath file. So we'll be doing this stuff step by step tomorrow. All right. Apparently, it wants me to really wants me to open up a weather file. Okay, it's an EPW format. I'm going to hit cancel for a moment. And the reason it's doing that is because this is set to true. I'm going to turn that to false. All right. So um, if I go all the way to the left, and this is how we how we read Rhino files or sorry Grasshopper files. We read them from left to right. So information flows from left to right. So um, at the very beginning, it says, well, you know, what we need to do is we need to set this to true. And what that'll do is that'll bring up a weather data map to the Ladybug tools in my browser. And as soon as this opens, I can go ahead and, and pan and zoom into Southern Nevada here. Oop. Ah, always weird, right? Like as soon as the Mac started like all the, the, the touch screen stuff with your fingers, right? Then they flipped the direction of the scrollers, right? And Windows didn't flip them. So sometimes it's I, I get a little confused as to which way is zooming in and which way is zooming out. Let's see, sorry. And I'm in Microsoft Edge browser, Explorer or whatever it is. All right, so I'm just going to zoom in on Las Vegas, and there should be some airport weather files here. There's one for North Las Vegas Airport. I believe there's one here for what used to be called McCarran Airport. So I can download that from the DOE, and it should quite literally just be a file that will go in my downloads. You can move that around if you want, but it's basically just a zip file. I'm going to open this up just to show you what that is. Yeah, so we have a DDY file, an EPW file, an MOS file, an STAT. Um, that EPW file is what uh, what Ladybug wants, and so it's going to open that up first. Um, let's see. Let's go to downloads, and I'm just going to really quickly decompress this, uh, or sorry, sort of unzip it. Can you unzip things? Decompress. Zip file. How do you open on Mac, show in Finder, and all extract all? There we go. Yeah. So in other words, it's just going to extract a, a file so it's not zipped up in a, in one place anymore. It'll just be in a, a folder. All right. And there's the folder now. All right. So anyway, um, I'm just going to go to that folder and point it to the, the EPW, whatever this was. Oh, wait. Yeah. Sorry. This is just in Windows Explorer. All right, so anyway, I can close my browser now. I have that that file. I can go ahead and set this back to false. That's just the toggle to or false switch. Now over here, where it said open the EDPW file, I'm gonna go ahead and double click that to turn that to true. And it's gonna tell me, okay, which file do you wanna run? I'm gonna go ahead to my downloads and and uh, select this uh, McCarran Airport file. I'll have all of the most recent Las Vegas um, uh, weather data, right? Okay, so it has something that, that interprets this. First of all, pulls out the location and latitude from the weather data, um, plugs that into location. So we can see that we have a node. It wants to know where the north direction is in my Rhino file, um, what the location is from the weather data, then what hour, day, month, time step analysis period we're using. 
Um, it wants a center point for where to set up the sun path. Um, it wants a scale, et cetera, right? Um, and then it, it gives us some outputs, right? So in other words, just like if we are clicking a, a tool over here, and it would it'd tell us in the command line, well, I want a, a point to center around. And then I want, like, give me a, a number, right, for the scale factor. And, um, you know, give me a vector, like click a reference point, a target point to show me which directions and more. Those sorts of things, right? Um, it wants some parameters at the beginning, and then it gives us outputs at the end, right? We can take those, and then we can plug them in here, and we can bake them into our Rhino file afterwards. So this is kind of how it works. I'm just going to zoom out a little bit, right? So now we can see that based off of the weather data, um, our location and latitude, it gives us a sun path, right? So at the lowest part of the sky, right, there's sort of the shortest day of the year, December 21st, typically. Um, our sun path will be like this. It'll be, uh, the sun will be rising south, uh, sorry, east, southeast. Um, it'll be low in the sky. Uh, this path will be shorter because it's a shorter day. Um, it, it sets in uh, west, southwest, right? Um, and of course, we can see the the high, the sorry, the longest day of the year, which is coming up. It's either today or tomorrow. It's usually the twenty first of June, the solstice, uh, the summer solstice. Um, our sun path is going to be the highest in the sky. It's going to be the longest path. Um, it's going to uh, rise north, set northwest, and uh, and uh, or sorry, north northeast, and and set north northwest. So uh, yeah, anyway, um, you can sort of see this, and then and all the things in between, right? So what this is predicated on is that I set this to adjust the time, the month six, so June seventeenth. I double click this and change it to twenty first. Um, and then hour 10 a.m., right? Uh, I could change that. So I could change it to, let's say, 8 a.m. Of course, it's going to ch change its position in the sky. It's going to be further east and lower in the sky. Change it to solar noon. It's going to be at the highest, right? You can change it for 5 p.m. Oh, sorry. 5 p.m., which would be 17. 12 plus 5. <laughs> Forgot basic math today. All right. You can see there's that pesky sun at the hottest time of the day, 4 or 5 p.m. ish. Right? Um, before it's sort of set behind the mountains and, and hills. Uh, so anyway, um, I can actually change the, let's say the scale of this so that it's a little more suitable for, in this case, just a building that we're looking at or downtown Las Vegas, if we're looking at that. Um, maybe the sun is a little large. Um, it's, it's graphic representation anyway. So I can go ahead and scale that. And on, on, right? So um, I can begin to sort of, again, track where the sun is in a given position and start to understand from this ray that's drawn. Uh, let me just position my cursor so you can actually see it. This ray, like what direction the sunlight's coming from, right? So the sun is so large. And we're usually typically measuring just such a small portion of the Earth um, that for all practical purposes, the sun rays, um, we, we see this direction, and then we just presume that it's parallel, right? So it's not like we make a point, and then we project things radially from that point, because the point is so far away <laughs> um, that, that for all practical purposes, the, 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 the rays of the sun are parallel to us, okay? Um, and so this direction becomes su really super important right, um, for us to begin to understand. And so again, with these sliders, I could change, let's say the month, we could begin to see that when we get really close to winter time, 5 p.m., the sun is even beyond the horizon, right? It's already sunset. And we know that because um, you know, frustratingly in December and January, it's like, it feels like it's um, pitch dark out by like three or 4 p.m., right? Um, let me go back to June, or we could begin to just track things during the daytime, right? Sort of see where things happen, right? Um, we could snapshot this just, you know, at key times of the day and year, right? In order to sort of understand the minimum maximums, right? So we could begin to understand um, the sort of extreme in the summertime, the solstice, June 21st, the key times of the day, 
um, winter solstice, the sort of the other extreme, right, where the, the sun is farthest away and, and sort of not overhead as much, um, and uh, begin to understand that daily, uh, we could also understand the, the sort of the, the uh, equilibrium between those two, the equinoxes, the Mar uh, March 21st, September 21st, where the sun theoretically rises due east and sets due west, and um, you have sort of equal day and night, right? Um, so, with that said, I, I found that to be a helpful tool for you guys to understand what the sun's doing and where it's at in a given time, right? Um, and so, um, why it's doing some of the things that we'll see on the on the next file, right? So that's sun path. Next file I'll open up is called solar radiation, I believe. And I just have to find the right place. That's the downloads on Windows side. Downloads here is the Mac side. Yeah, perfect. Okay, sorry. Go through this in my head. So direct radiation is the next one. This is measuring solar radiation. So this is the amount of sun that's hitting a surface in, um, over a certain amount of time. Again, here at the, at the if you need it, you can run this at the very beginning and, and toggle it, and it'll prompt you for a weather file. We've already downloaded a weather file, or I have already have, so I'm good. What I'm going to do is I'm going to double check these. This is set to false. This is set to false. This is set to false. There's multiple gates. And the reason for that is because as we start to plug in information, it starts to do lots and lots and lots and lots of calculations, right? And they're sort of, they cascade. The information cascades from one widget to the next, right? And so um, if I want to change something way up here, I don't want to have to wait for it, all of this to calculate and then pass to this and all of this to calculate and pass to this, all of this to calculate, pass to this and all of this to calculate and pass to this just to go back and change one little thing and then wait for it all to change and cascade again, right? So I'm setting these all to false so I can just sort of open the gates one at a time as I want to, right? So I'm gonna say true. It's gonna prompt me for a weather file again, in which case I'm just gonna to go to my downloads. There it is, all righty. This orange widget saying, well, didn't have any information plugged into it, now has information plugged into it, okay? So it's opening up that file, it's plugging it in. It's giving me all kinds of stuff. The latitude, location, dry bulb temperature, average temperature, dew point, average temperature, relative humidities, wind speeds, wind directions. Um, what you'll find is that this is a, there's more granular stuff here than just that. Um, because you can actually uh, uh, um, begin to aggregate this stuff uh, by time and by time period. So for instance, here's the weather that it's, com it's compiling in this widget, a cumulative sky matrix. Right? This is what we talked about when it comes to uh, uh, the whole dome of sky that we see from any given point on Earth. Um, but it's it's looking at the amount of sun, uh, sun daylight hours and everything else, where the sun's coming from um, over a period of time. In, in this case, what I've done is I've set it to be from January 1st at 1 a.m. all the way to um, December 30th at 11 p.m., right? So a whole year basically. And I say, go ahead and um, plug that in to the analysis period. Now, now aggregate the entire cumulative sky, sky matrix for a yearly average. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and set this one to true. You'll see that something will pop up and it's calculating. This is maybe what it uses radians for. I'm not sure. So it's calculating something in the background. Um, this will eventually be set to true. It's taking a minute, right? It's got a lot of things to calculate. And my computer, frankly, is just not up to task here. Used to be so fast, blazing fast. Now, eh. 2023 standards, it's kind of a dinosaur. As I found out when I was trying to run a latent diffusion AI model on it uh, locally, um, just graphics card just wouldn't work. So anyway... Um, there we have it. Now, finally, it's going to plug this in and actually begin to overlay that that data on some sort of geometry that we give it. We can give it geometry that we want to sort of overlay the solar and, and the radiation data on. We can also give it any context that we want, right? The context is important because context casts shadows, right? And so um, what we're gonna, I'm going to do is I have widgets for both of these two inputs. And I'm just going to right-click don't worry, we'll go over this step by step tomorrow when you have these things um, done. But just want to sort of whet your appetite here. Let me go ahead and say, I want to measure this stuff, this uh, this axon, this planar composition I've made. 
I also want it to be the occluding geometry. I want it to sort of make sure that anything that shadows being cast are cast, right? So set multiple B-wraps. I'll go ahead and select these as well. I could select neighboring buildings, you know, that that big building on Las Vegas Boulevard over by Dina's site, or, um, you know, that uh, that uh, parking garage across the street from, from Alex's site on you know, Fremont Street, whatever it is, right? Um, so anyway, all I'm doing is I'm referencing geometry in from Rhino into Grasshopper and start to, to use it to to uh, measure occlude and and display some of this data. All right, so last but not least, I just need to set this to true. Go ahead and um, do that right now. It might take a minute or two for it to sort of pump this data in here and, and start to overlay the information. But suffice to say, there's other things I can talk about how granular uh, the grid size is. In other words, the sort of granularity of the sort of uh, false color map that it puts on here that you'll see. Um, and, uh, well, you'll see in just a minute, but, uh, basically I'm going to create a, a radiate, what it calls a radiation map, but it's going to add, you know, if you ever seen a performance diagram where it's like color coded, like red means like brightest, hottest, blue means coolest. And, you know, there's this sort of range of colors in between, um, in a gradient sort of fashion. That's what this is going to do for us. It's going to create a false color map. Where it's going to give us all the quantitative data, but it's going to give us a visual display of it. Um, so intuitively, we can begin to sort of see um, where those spots are. I'm going to go ahead and you can see I have grasshopper geometry overlaying rhino geometry. It sort of has that marbled look because we have um, two things that are sort of uh, duplicates of each other. I'm just going to go ahead and turn the rhino geometry off, right? And you can start to see, aha, here we go. All right. So I can intuitively understand which way south is <laughs> based off of this. Um, that roof is going to get, and all these horizontal surfaces are going to get a tremendous amount of heat for solar radiation, and therefore going to have direct sunlight striking it and going to generate heat, right? Um, we're going to get a lot of south faces that are going to be up there as well, sort of in their orange range. Um, sometimes some of the things are in shade. They're going to, going to um, get less radiation over the entire course of the year, right? We can see how effective horizontal shading structures are on the south side, right? We can see a lot of blue underneath some of these horizontal, these deeper horizontal surfaces um, and how they begin to cast shadows behind them, right? Now, obviously when the winter is time, when the sun is lower in the sky, we're gonna get some, we're gonna get some deeper uh, sunlight penetration there. Um, so we will get some yellows and, and maybe even some oranges on some of these faces. Um, and, you know, sometimes you can look at that and go, well, Maybe when it's colder out, maybe th then I don't mind a little bit of solar radiation on the inside and a little bit of heat gain, right? Um, you have to be careful with that. Um, you know, you, you still don't want the greenhouse effect in your house. That's how you bake people. Um, if you don't believe me, sit in your car for a while in the parking lot today um, when the sun's out and you'll see exactly what I mean. So uh, don't do it for too long, though. Um, and don't leave any pets or children in that car um, because that would be... Uh, uh, you know, obviously a disaster, but um, that's what we have to worry about, right? We don't want our buildings to to, to basically fry people, right? Um, people don't like to be cooked alive or dead. Yeah, so anyway, uh, so we can begin to see the implications of some of these windows on the inside, right? We can see that even deep inside, we can start to get a little bit of yellow to go with the blues, right? So we can start to see um, that some, sometimes there's some direct light coming in through those those apertures, um, which is not a huge surprise. We can probably notice them on the inside on the on the floor planes as well, right? So we can then begin to sort of talk, look inside and begin to in the outside, the inside and the outside, and begin to understand where we might have problem areas, right? Which faces are getting the most sun, right? And uh, when it's direct sun like this and this, we want to minimize openings or minimize the ways that um, we make openings or begin to be very strategic about the way we make openings in order to minimize the amount of direct daylight, that direct sunlight that begins to strike surfaces back here on the inside, right? As we know, um, if you have a west-facing, my, my house actually has a west-facing uh, backyard. Um, and so it has a west-facing sliding glass doorway that's quite wide. Um, and then, you know, from about, 2 p.m. on to about 6 p.m. or 5 p.m. or 4 p.m. depending on the, the time of the day and time of year. 
um, you know, I, I have to sort of close curtains off just to sort of try to keep the, the heat down a little bit, right? Um, in other words, try to try to keep the heat up by the on the periphery of the house and not let it um, come in and, and strike all the floors in my house and and warm everything up dramatically. All right. If I was really serious about that, I would install shades on the outside of the house so that that heat stays on the outside rather than gets in the inside at all, right? So um, in our buildings, we can think the same way when we think about breeze blocks. You know, a lot of these things that uh, um, we either see in like let's say mid-century modern that comes from a sort of larger pattern of how we build narrative environments we can think about um uh these sort of really elaborate uh screens and shades um from islamic cultures in, in parts of northern africa and other parts of the middle east and um the iberian peninsula um we can think about uh, again sort of breeze blocks breeze delays and other sort of uh things that we've done in the desert right screening becomes important um separating light from heat bouncing some of that direct light around um so that we get some of that indirect daylight bouncing into our building um but don't necessarily allow all the direct light in to, to sort of convert to heat energy inside of our building becomes super important right um whether that happens on the outside and then begins to form out uh sort of begins to define outdoor spaces as well um is another thing that that you find in common right so if we're going to use glass in this on the south side I'd probably inset that glass way back. I begin to try to figure out ways to screen, shade, or otherwise, right? Um, we can think about how we would shade ourselves. Um, we either put on a hat with a wide brim, right? Um, I think that's a certain, uh, um, maybe that's a certain demographic, like age-wise, like 40 and older or something that use those things. <laughs> uh, ball caps, right? Again, the brim helps. Doesn't help with our ears, but it helps with our face. Um, we can think about, I think about some of the landscape folks that I see outside landscapers when they're working outside or roofers and, and other people working on framing crews, they're building houses all around me. Um, they wear long sleeves, right? That's to keep the sun off the skin, right? Not necessarily because they're chilly. In fact, they aren't, right? So we can begin to think about, uh, different ways to sort of screen light, uh, provide shade, et cetera. Right. And, you know, it, it's. You can do it from the top, you can do it from the sides. Um, uh, it can be part of the envelope, it can be part of the roof, it can be put overhangs. There's lots of ways to do it inventively um, where you're sort of trying to solve more than one problem at the same time or create, you solve a problem, but you're also creating several opportunities you can take advantage of, right? Um, okay, so. With this, I can begin to make design decisions, those pushes and pulls, um, those sliding, where I let, let in light. Um, I could begin to sort of fine tune those, close certain corners, open other corners, right? Um, based off of just sun, right? Um, and then, you know, if I'm thinking about why well, I really want an opening here to sort of see a particular view, then I, I sort of try to, try to I, you can use this data to sort of negotiate well, how can I open that up but not expose the entire building to a dramatic amount of desert sun and heat, right? So negotiating between two competing constraints, views out, but not letting a bunch of direct daylight in or sunlight in, right? And I usually, we usually use those terms, sunlight and daylight, they're not interchangeable. Sunlight, we're usually referring to direct sun rays um, that haven't been bounced or, or that are coming through the sky vault um, and then are striking directly um, Daylight, we usually refer to as all the scattered light that's not direct, but sort of bouncing around and, and a little more diffuse, right? So um, we can use things like light shells to, and, and free soleils, um, baffles, louvers, and things on the outside to convert and uh, bounce uh, direct sunlight, um, convert into daylight that's sort of bouncing around and then can sort of bounce into the building um, through windows that are further set back, right? Something like that. So. All right. So that's um, those are two things that we'll be dealing with. And we can do this on the macro level, um, sort of downtown and sort of understanding where there's hot spots. But, but I, what I really like to do is to sort of see these tools used where we take a snapshot. We, we sort of do it before, and then we do some midpoints as you start to make more decisions you can turn to this to sort of understand, well, okay, I made this decision based off of making this volume on the inside or 
um, allowing this view of uh, the stratosphere down the street or whatever it is, right? Now let's check out the implications of that when it comes to sun. Um, and so what we can do is we can begin to take snapshots of how your design evolves with this analysis to sort of understand how the analysis informed your design decision-making, right? So that, because at the end, if you show something that, you know, is largely, if you have a lot of red and orange on the inside, we have problems, we have issues. That's a, that's a big red flag, <laughs> literally, <laughs> um, but also figuratively, right? Um, you know, that's, that's one of the things we want to try to avoid, in other words, okay? All right, so you can use these tools to help you. Okay. Let me just do that. Uh, let me turn this gate to false. Let me turn on my rhino geometry. I just had that, that layer turned off. Um, the reason I'm doing that is because I don't want to like, I don't want to try to recalculate all this stuff as I'm progressively as I'm moving. So I'll just move this away and make this, this hole wider, right? Or even move it out of the way entirely almost. I mean, it's sort of hanging, but whatever. I'm just sort of demonstrating the point of, you know, we should see an update now when I turn it to true. And it might take a minute for it to recalculate everything or re sort of project the map onto the, the surface. Another thing that informs how much data and how granular it's doing as grid size, right? So I can actually make a really small tight grid, in which case I'll get more granular data. Each each little piece of the grid will be analyzed separately. Um, but when you do that across a volume, um, the amount of information it needs and the amount of time it needs to calculate that starts to grow exponentially, you realize, right? So um, when you think about how, um, you know, dimensions in X, Y, and Z start to start to double and triple, um, and then, you know, that, that begins to then multiply out, um, becomes, becomes kind of dangerous there. Um, right. So you can see immediately the, the stuff on immediately to the inside and even deeper down here with certain angles are starting to get a lot more solar radiation. So that's going to be a huge hot spot. There's not a big, big surprise, obviously a big, large South facing window is going to let in a lot of direct light when the sun is to the south, which is most of the day, right? So, okay. But you can see that it really does update and calculate all this stuff for you. You can see how, you know, you can see the geometries of the shadows um, or the occlusions from, you know, the sort of geometry that we have here. And again, this is an average. So it's not just one snapshot, one time of the, of the day and year. This is across the entire year. So, um, you know, if we were, for instance, thinking about, well, let's look at the summertime versus the swing season time, those elbows like uh, March and September, sort of spring, autumn, um, and, and then compare those also just the, the summer or the winter, right? We could begin to look at this, the coolest time of the year and the warmest time of the year. Maybe we want to minimize this during the warmest times of the year, not necessarily during the coolest times of the year, right? So we could begin to sort of make trade-offs and decisions like that um, by simply going back, let me just... In. So this is where Grasshopper disappeared. It's still here. If I minimize Rhino, so it's not playing my screen, you can see that it actually just went to the behind Rhino. I don't know why it does that sometimes. It's annoying, but it does. Um, um, I could always change that. I could change the grid size. I could change the time of day and, and which what part we're sampling, right? So if I wanted to do this, I would simply set this back to false. And let's just look at today, month six, day 20th, hour one, and we'll go six and 20, right? So just today, and we'll go to the end of the day, right? We don't necessarily need to go to all the way to, to 11 but or 12 or whatever, but we will anyway. Why not, right? All right, so um, let's just look at the summertime, like the summer solstice condition today. Yeah, so it's working. <laughs> Sometimes I look and look for the not responding. It just means it's really, really working. I haven't seen any smoke come out of my laptop yet. Um, so the fan's running high gear, though. We'll just see what this looks like. Okay, But I just wanted to sort of acquaint you with these tools. 
um, and then how you can begin to use them, right? I mean, I, I know in ECS, there's probably some, I don't know, maybe there's, uh, I'm not sure if there's, if what what they do in there, but, um, you know, my my hope is that, that you know, there, there's an acknowledgement that there's some digital ways of sort of measuring these things and analyzing these things. And there's there's definitely some very old analog ways of doing it, right? So you can see in the South, majority of stuff's hitting the horizontal surfaces. And then lower in the sky in the east and the west ends, we're starting to get some more radiation, right? And of course, if I change that day time, try to bring grasshopper back up, here we go. Um, let me set that to false. Um, let's set the month to December. Oops, there we go. Turn that back on. Um, I'm guessing that the tops, you know, the sun's not going to be nearly as high in the sky, so the tops will get less solar radiation um, and the sides will get a lot more, right? And we'll get some depth to the sort of solar penetration inside. That'd be my my uh, guess offhand, just, you know, some little common sense, but. And then here in a minute, I'll show you the, the third file, which is uh, looking at wind. Also takes the weather data from the airport um, to find prevailing winds and a wind rose. We can map those up and then begin to draw them on ourselves and, and start to talk about um, wind trajectories and eddies and things like that. Yeah, so here now we get a very dramatic, I mean, that south part is red. It's not the hottest time of the year necessarily, but we start to see a lot of sunlight penetration on the inside, right? Um, which isn't necessarily a terrible, terrible thing in some days in December when it actually is kind of chilly here. Um, all right, so that's how you can use that file. And again, we'll go through this step-by-step -step tomorrow um, after hopefully you, everybody has these things um, uh, installed on their system. Josh, I have a question. Yeah. Are you are you able to like superimpose vegetation and then Ladybug can take a reading based on like deciduous trees, uh, you know, for winter penetration? Ah, excellent. So like a well-planted tree, right? Right. Um, or other vegetation that isn't necessarily like a concrete surface or a neighbor that's extruded, right? Um, yes. not, not easily. You would have to try to simulate that somehow with its height and its spread. Um, so there's no good way of doing that. And if there was, even if we did have like a poly tree that looked kind of close, um, that's a lot of poly, that, that's a big mesh. So it would make the file really heavy. So that is a limitation of these tools for sure. Right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Good question. Um, I'm just going to, I just opened up the last one, I, bel I believe. Um, and I'm just going to, oh, wait, no, grasshopper files later. Let me just open up the, the next grasshopper file, the wind one. And I'll show you a little bit of that, that wind arrow helix. So where are all these widgets coming from? Right, I'll show you that in just a second. Let me, it really wants a weather file here. So let me give one, give it one here. Uh, let's see. There we are. Sure. Why not? There we are. Okay. So you can see that just like there's a toolbar on Rhino on the left-hand side, there's a set of tools on the, on the top in, in a Grasshopper, and there's a set of widgets. And we'll talk more about these. I can give you guys some, some Grasshopper, some basic Grasshopper stuff later. Um, I think you have to learn how to model things first in Rhino before you can sort of understand the logic behind Grasshopper. Um, because Grasshopper is all about thinking about, uh, is all about mapping that process um, rather than making a specific product right at the end. So, um, so you can see now, um, once we have Honeybee and Ladybug installed, we have a bunch of Honeybee, Honeybee tools and a bunch of Ladybug tools, right? So here's analyzing the weather data, here's visualizing weather data, environmental analysis. There's even a thing about renewables and calculating things like that. Um, Honeybee, we have all the daylight tools, radiance, daylight factor, 
right? So you can get, I mean, whenever you see someone like Thurn Tomasetti, Overup, or um, Euro Happold using these tools, and you know they're serious about about like using them to actually try to measure performance before you spend millions of dollars on something, right? Um, in order to sort of make sure that it's going to, um, it's optimized for performance, right? When it comes to um, uh, sort of lifetime of, of withstanding sun and, and wind and et cetera. All right, so let's see here. What do I have here? Oh, I have a bunch of stuff. Ay, ay, ay. Let me just zoom out. Okay, so down here we have some of these uh, ladybug tools to make a wind rose. And here on my screen, you can see a rather large, ridiculously large wind rose. So this is based on the airport, the weather data collected for the National Weather Service at the airport. Um, you can see that there's, depending on what time of the Day. So this is from month nine to month 11, right? So this is looking at autumn, <laughs> September to November. Um, the prevailing winds are coming either from the um, north or from the west, right? There's a little bit of some, some that comes from the east and parts of the south. But if you look at this, there's some north wind sometimes, and there's some west-southwest winds sometimes, west and west-southwest winds sometimes, right? Um, and so what we could begin to do is actually map those out then in our sites and in, in downtown. And we could begin to, let's see here. Oh, let me turn on my, sorry, my Rhino was, uh, layer was turned off. So let me turn that back on. Dun, dun, dun. First of all, this wind rose is like the ground plane underneath my building. So that's kind of weird. Um, but we could actually use this. This is meant to to be a, a kind of a handy tool where you can generate, uh, let's say, um, you could draw manually. Let's see here. Let me go in top view and do that really quickly. Um, what might look like the, the uh, seriously, Okay. Sorry, my my laptop is you have had windows open too long. Let me just make sure ortho's turned off here and I gotta move zoom around in order to find ortho. All right. So maybe I'm trying to draw those sort of west southwest winds um in that sort of larger city map. I might start to draw some of these. Uh, splines through um, through some of those corridors and around blocks and things like that, trying to sort of relate those. And of course, my sorry, the reason you can't see what I just drew is because my layer layer I set as an active layer is white. I'm just going to set that to black so it's a little easier to see things. There we go. Um, then what you can do is you could begin to let me just draw one more here. Oh, that was a polyline for some reason. I don't know why I selected polyline. All right. Um, let's see here. I could set one of these curves, bring it into Grasshopper, right? And it can. I basically set it up to to sort of create some sort of three dimensional sort of vortexing smart arrow of wind through certain corridors, right? So um, with that sort of graphic representation, that sort of nineteen seventies landscape graphic arrowhead that I I learned way back in the days. Um, I wasn't even born until you know, but I I wasn't born, didn't live in the nineteen seventies, but those graphics are so pervasive. Um, everybody that taught me when I was doing my B arc learned those graphics anyway so um you know as again to sort of generate you know in your um in your uh city your downtown dtlv um uh, rhino file you could begin to sort of map some of these winds and and bake them in right so and then from there i could i could take this i could take this surface um let's see here 
bake them into Rhino. Um, sure, why not? Turn them into to real Rhino geometry here. Um, and then I could render those out as well, right? So I could be in the create diagram showing wind in different um, different scenarios. Um, and I've sort of made this grasshopper file that sort of takes and twists a helix along it to create something that that looks like uh, a little bit like uh, the way wind reacts. Okay, so. Again, I'm just sort of making some of these things available to you guys. We'll we'll go through them step by step um, tomorrow, and then we'll we'll need to do some more step by step stuff with them probably again on Thursday uh, before I release you guys over the weekend to sort of generate some things. Um, let me just close that for a second. You can see then uh, I have these things, and I could render them out and um, or whatever. Um, let's select them, give them a different shader, maybe. Let's see here. Let's go with plaster. Let's just change the color of it. And my rendering settings are doing something weird, as I probably need to restart my system. Yeah, see how it's rendering kind of odd. Uh, not like the way it's supposed to, but I can, I hopefully I can still change the color and then set it something super bright. So Brian makes your teeth hurt looking at it. Oh, and last but not least, I actually have with these selected, I have to say, well, set these to sign this to this, uh, you know, so don't make bright pink ones, but, you know, unless you really love this magenta, but you can start to see that I can, I can begin to generate a set of graphics based off of this just to sort of begin to, to show what that wind rose really means. Um, begin to understand what corridors might be windier, um, et cetera, or what 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 parts of it are blocked. Um, that's really important. You know, I, I think about March and April in particular, um, or days like yesterday we had where we had lots of gusts. Um, you know, when weather blows in, it can be quite dramatic, especially in those swing seasons. Um, <clears throat> you know, they're a source of dust and allergens. Um, but they can also be kind of violent. Um, if you don't believe me, look at some of the older uh, fabric uh, tensile structures that they, shading structures they put over playgrounds. Um, sometimes that's when they, they fail, they get ripped up when they're, when they're a little old and uh, past their prime. All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing for a moment. I'm going to go ahead and stop recording as well.